Okay, just want to briefly do a little intro. This is a very nice interview, but unfortunately there's no video. So if you absolutely want to have video, uh, please turn it off, go do something else. And uh, I wanted to comment uh, a bunch of things on that, so uh, I'm not going to put all this psychobabble right in the beginning. I'm going to um, put that at the end. So if uh, you see my pretty face come back on, you'll know the interview is over and it's uh, my turn. So uh, go ahead then, if you want to uh, listen to the interview, uh, It'll start now. Give it all. Thanks. I appreciate this very much. How did you get started in knife making? Uh, I've always made knives ever since I was a kid. When I was living in Guatemala, I had a friend who um, worked, uh, he lived in a store uh, next to the jade shop that I was a manager of in Antigua, Guatemala. And um, he used to get the American Blade magazine. This is the end of the 70s. And um, he had brought over from Germany all the parts and pieces of the old Nazi daggers that had been made and then stored during the war. And he bought them, brought them over to Savannah, Georgia, and had people put them back together again. The Luftwaffe dagger, the Hitler Youth dagger, um, all these uh, special uniform daggers. And we became good friends, and he got me interested in uh, making knives and actually selling them, not just keeping them. So I started, um, made my first knife in 1980, Christmas Eve, 1980, um, and it was in the jade shop, and I was fortunate because a lot of the machinery that was used to make jade, grinders and... Um, drill presses with special drill bits and so forth uh, was also the same kind of equipment you used to make a knife. But how old were you then, 1980? Don't ask. Okay, probably 12 or so, yeah. <laughs> My 60th birthday was 1994. Okay. No. My, I'm sorry, did I say 60? Yeah. It was 50. 50. My 50th birthday was 19... I was born in 1944. Okay. And for my birthday year, 1994, every knife that I made had a solid gold plug in the blade with the number 50 stamped on it. So if you see a Terzawola knife with a gold plug and the 50... You know, that was made in 1994 for my birthday year, my 50th birthday year. Okay. Now, the big story, because I'm into mechanisms, is uh, how you kind of got into the liner lock. I live in New Mexico. Michael Walker, who invented the liner lock, lives in Taos, New Mexico. And he and I had been friends for a long time. We'd known each other. <clears throat> we had traveled uh, to shows together, especially some European shows in Munich, Germany, and in France. And I called him up one day when I decided I really wanted to start making folders, because I had not made folders up to about 1980. Probably 84, the beginning of 85, I had been making exclusively fixed blades, mainly combat knives, but also hunting knives and skinners and some um, art knives with jade handles and so forth. I decided I wanted to make pocket knives, folding knives. And I didn't want to go through the learning curve of making a lockback and I was fascinated with the new, at that time, liner lock. Because nobody else was doing it except Michael. Michael Walker was the only one. He had invented it. And a lot of people had said, well, he simply took it from the old electrician's knife that had a, a plate of brass that slapped behind the screwdriver blade. 
But that's not true because the, the liner lock that he created is the only similar thing is that there's a piece of metal that comes behind the blade. But in terms of the lockup and the way it's held in place, um, the ramp on the back of the blade and the detent on the spring to hold the blade in the closed position was completely Michael Walker's idea and invention. Okay. So I called him up and I said, uh, Michael, I want to learn how to make liner lock. He said, well, get your ass in gear, get in the car, come up here, spend a day with me and um, I'll show you what I'm doing. And uh, I was hooked. He had made a couple, not very many, but a couple of knives out of titanium at the time. He was the first one to actually use titanium in a knife. I believe that I was the second, right after him. Um, and at a knife show that I went to in Eugene, Oregon, I met some people who were willing to drive me up to Kent, Washington, or down to Kent, Washington. I don't remember which direction it is. One is north of the other. Anyway, I was in Eugene, and we went to Kent, Washington, to the Boeing plant at Kent. And I went into their backyard, which was a scrap yard. <clears throat> they had a big bin full of sheet titanium. And my first sheets of titanium came from Boeing put in the back of the car and then carried it on the airplane and came back to, at that time, Santa Fe, New Mexico. That's where I was living. Now you developed your own style. You had what a lot of people refer to the, uh, the fail-safe lock. And uh, I, I read your book and uh, at the time I was so green I didn't understand all the esoterics. Could you go in there a little? Well, at that time, I was always looking for ways of improving whatever part of the knife I could. And one of the things I wanted to try was what we call the fail-safe or, uh, or uh, the, the... Actually, it's a, it's a curved bevel. It, it's, a, it's a curved surface on the lock face on the blade. Instead of being a flat plane going straight across... Um, we used a, um, a core drill, a diamond core drill, vertically to cut a rounded surface so that as the spring engages the blade, the resistance to the spring increases because it's running along, it's running against an increasing curve. It's really hard to explain without a drawing, but it could very easily be shown instead of having the spring engaging a straight surface like that, what we did was we created this is exaggerated, but it was a curved surface so that if the spring were to engage at this point, it would be impossible for it to go too much farther onto the other side because the distance is too great. If the spring were to wear, it could not wear enough to slide off the blade. Okay. That was still in the relatively early days. That was in the year 1999, 2000, when I made, um, my, when I uh, wrote my book, and that's in the book. And it works, and a curved surface works very nicely. There's no problems with it. What I've discovered over the years is that it's not really necessary. And the reason it's not necessary is because of two things. One, we're now carbonizing, adding carbide flakes to the front of the titanium to give it a harder surface when it engages the blade so it doesn't wear as much. That's number one. Number two, 
even if it didn't have the carbide face. I noticed over the years, I had made my first folders in 85, 84, 86, somewhere around there. By the year 2000, 1999, I was getting some knives back from users who had been using them hard um, and asking to have the blades adjusted, the springs adjusted, have scratches taken out, because my knives were always well used. They were not just put in drawers. And I was noticing that the springs generally did not move very far over on the blade. It did, it did, they didn't go very much. I was expecting that they would wear out a great deal. It turns out they were not for a number of reasons. One, every time the knife is open, that titanium spring hammers itself against the blade, which is harder than the titanium. Titanium is not a hard metal. It's a tough metal and springy, but it's not, it doesn't have hardness to it. By hammering itself against the hardened blade, it would, what we call hammer forge, or, or work hardening. And work hardening is, for example, if you get a paper clip, as everybody has done, and you bend it and bend it up and down and up and down and up and down, finally the paper clip will snap. That's because you've work hardened the steel. It gets to the point where it's so hard that it's brittle. Okay. The titanium doesn't get brittle, but it does get hard. And as it hammers itself against the back of the blade, it also mushrooms just a little bit. Not very much, just a little bit. So you're increasing the surface area, number one, and hardening that surface area, number two. As a result, after a period of time of breaking in, that titanium just will not um, wear down anymore. So a straight line lock face on the bevel is just as efficient and just as strong and just as good as a curved one. I find that there's really no difference between the two. Are you carbonizing your yeah. knives? You are. Yes. Okay. Carbonize the titanium face where it, where it engages the blade. You like use one of those little pencil things? To... Yeah, it's a um, it's a modified um, modified uh, engraving machine. I'm not totally exactly sure electronically how they're made. They come with another electronic component, and you put in a carbide, old carbide drill, for example, in the, in the holder, and um, turn it on, it creates an electric current, and it, uh, it, it adds carbide granules to the softer titanium. Okay. So in your not-so-humble opinion, you would think that that's a better way to construct the lock with the with the car, carbonization. I, I like it a lot. Yeah, I, it it also prevents it from keep it keeps the sticking component down. <clears throat> the thing about titanium and steel is that they have a molecular affinity for each other. They're completely different families, but they will gall one to the other. It'll scrape off. It'll, it'll jam. And that's one of the reasons why a titanium lock will jam. One of the reasons, there are, many, there are several reasons, but one of the reasons is that titanium galls with the steel. And if you have an interface between the two, it works out much better. And your opinion of the liner lock, uh, what would you say the pluses, minuses, uh, you know, like the one hand open, one hand closed, thing like that? Uh, you, you think the, one of the big around? one of the big drawbacks to a lock back, that is where the spring is on top of the blade, um, applies pressure to the top of the blade, and either on a slip joint holds the blade open simply by pressure or a lockback where 
the spring on top of the blade engages a groove in the, in the top of the blade and actually locks. One of the disadvantages is that you've got a great deal of force being applied to the blade itself. Every time you're opening and closing a lock back, you're applying a great deal of force to the pivot. And unless you've got some really polished surfaces with some well-matched hardnesses between the pivot and the blade, you can run into wear problems on the pivot because there's a great deal of force, especially on a slip joint because the stronger the spring pressure, the more secure the blade is in the open position. And it's very difficult to open it with one hand, to open up a slip joint with one hand. I did develop a slip joint type of knife that doesn't lock, that uses two detents. We used a, a detent ball on the spring in a liner lock to hold the blade closed in the closed position. It engages a little divot in the side of the blade kind of holds it there and you have to overcome that in order to over in order to open it it's not very strong and it's not very powerful and once it breaks there is no pressure on it just the blade just flies open easily that's how come we can make a flipper because there's no continuing pressure on the blade the breakage of the ball going out of the divot is momentary yeah and it's it's what we call it what we call a catastrophic break. It occurs all at once, instantly. Whereas with a slip joint that has the spring on the top, that pressure is constantly on the back of the blade because the spring doesn't have any place to go. The the, the one that I design has two springs in the one on each side of the blade embedded in the handle. And that, they, I think that mechanism is in the book, by the way. Oh, that could be. Yeah. Did you give me credit for it? Uh, actually, somebody, some Chinese guy, I think, had a patent on it. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, well. I mean, yours might have been a little bit different. I don't know. But it was fairly, fairly recent. I, I think it was only 10 years ago. It was, well, uh, maybe we'll look at it. Spyderco made the, the only commercial knife that I know of with that. It's called the Slip It. And okay. it's one of those, it's the only slip joint that you can open easily with one hand. Because when you have that momentary catastrophic break, the blade has no pressure on it except when the balls re engage now when the blade is in the open position. Okay. Anyway. Um, well, Bob Loveless is kind of credited for the drop point hunter, and Michael Walker's credited for the liner lock, liner and lock. you're kind of credited for the tactical knife. How would you? How did you get started into that? Um, probably the single best word to describe that would be laziness. I wasn't. I wanted to make folding knives, and at that time, everybody was making very fancy. And I shouldn't say very fancy, but well dressed folding knives, beautifully made, pocket jewelry. All of the folding knives were 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 decorated and handsome in some way. I was known more for my combat knives. Being in Central America, having made knives for commandos, operators of various countries, including Argentina, Salvador, Guatemala, the United States, Great Britain. Um, I made knives for them. I was kind of known more for my military, paramilitary, law enforcement type of knives rather than the better looking wood handled skinners and so forth. Okay. So I wanted to do some folding knives that were within that 
genre. And like I said, it was lazy. First of all, I really didn't want to use pins to pin a knife together like everybody else was doing. Because once you pin a knife together, it is together. And that's it. And then you have to literally kind of destroy part of it if you have to redo it or adjust it or fix it, etc. I didn't want to do that. Um, I looked at the most popular folding knife of the day at that time was the Buck 110. Rosewood scales, solid brass front and back. Very heavy. A boat anchor. Lovely knife. I had one and carried it myself in Guatemala. Um, and I said to myself, you gotta, gotta be able to do something better than this. And being in the jungles, being in Central America, dealing with people who were going to be in sand and dirt and places where a folding knife can get really messed up. I wanted to make a knife that they could maintain easily. So I decided I'm going to screw this whole thing together and make it so that it can be unscrewed and the guy can take it apart and put it together again. Because one of the beautiful things about a liner lock is if it's well made, and that's the caveat, well made. If it's well made, everything goes back to zero. When you put the screws in, when you put the pin in, when you put the clip on, when everything's done, it'll work the same way as before you took it apart. You don't have to destroy anything. You don't have to play around with a special pin or anything like that. So, I was aiming my knife. I had a Model 1 and then a Model 2, which was called the Mariner. I made very few of those. The Model 1 was... Uh, Kind of just a spear point, uh, three and a half inch blade. Very simple. Said, I don't need to put anything on the side. The titanium is perfectly usable, just as it is. Then I came up with the Model 3. The Model 3 turned out to be the ATCF. Model 3 and ATCF are the same knife. It's the Advanced Technology Combat Folder. And that was designed for... Field operators, police, military, but also people who like truckers, packers and shippers, people working on the docks, who needed a, a good, solid, heavy-duty knife that didn't weigh a pound and a half, that was relatively slim, convenient, and very secure in the open. And I was the first one to come up with a thumb ramp on the top of the blade, which was serrated for a thumb grip, acting as a as a guard, kind of a semi little bit of a guard, which when the blade was closed, mated and matched the ramp on the bottom, which formed the finger guard which would be the equivalent of a bottom guard of a knife. So we had a little bit of a top guard with the ramp, a little bit of a bottom guard, which is the curve, and the design was such that it was the ramp itself was unobtrusive when it was closed because it mated with the same slant that held that, uh, that, that curve, the choil. Not the choil, the uh, finger guard. That was my idea. Nobody had ever done that before. Sal Glesser had invented the pocket clip for the knife. And he put them on the first couple of Spyderco knives, including his Mariner. He had a Mariner knife also, which I used to carry in Guatemala. Mm. Um, and he was a good friend of mine. I had met him at a show. We became very good friends, both from New York. And he, um, I asked him and he gave me permission to put clips on my pocket knife. So I was the first custom knife maker to put a clip on a pocket knife. Um, okay. 
So that was another innovation, titanium and so forth. And I wanted a way of opening that knife quickly and easily with one hand because the liner lock with the ball bearing detent allows a knife to be opened with one hand. It doesn't have continual intense pressure on the blade. As I was saying before, it slides open very easily until it's locked in the open position and it slides closed very easily unless until it's held in place by the ball bearing, the detent. But in between, it's very easy to, to move. It doesn't require a great deal of pressure. So a one-hand opener is very feasible for a line opener. I said, okay. What I had done in Guatemala, I had taken some knives, including a buck 110, and I put a stud on the side of the blade. I drilled a hole, put a stud that was checkered, and it worked. It was okay. It was, it was nice. Uh, it sometimes grabbed the pocket as you were pulling it out because it protruded from the blade. So I thought about it and thought about it and thought about it, and then I invented the disc, the thumb disc. That was my invention also. Put that at the top of the blade. could be open left-handed or right-handed. It didn't catch on your pocket. It, didn't, it protruded, but it didn't catch. It didn't have a, didn't have a sharp edge. And um, it was relatively out of the way pretty much out of the way. So I started to use that as a trademark and pretty much everybody followed after that. Um, you'll see a lot of them on pocket knives, custom fancy ones and utility knives and so forth. That was my invention. That was about 86, I think. 86. Um, I think I went over my 10 minutes. I got... There's one more story I want to tell you. This is, a, this is a long story. I got to leave in ten minutes, but I got, this is a long story. But you may find this interesting, and I don't know if you know about it. When I made the, when I made a, a collaboration, I designed a knife with Spiderco, the first one called the C15. Okay. Have you heard this story before, from Sal Lesser? Okay. In 1989, I was at a shot show with Sal Lesser. We were having lunch, eating expensive hot dogs at the shot show. And he was complaining that he couldn't find a custom knife maker to design a Spyderco knife. He wanted to do a collaboration with a custom knife maker. He, had, he was very visionary at the time. Nobody had done that before. This is the first time. I said, how come? Why not? He said, well, they don't. I said, he said, I, I demand a hole in the blade. That's the Spyderco hole. That's, that's our brand. We don't have the hole, uh, we lose our brand face. Right, right. I said, "Well, you haven't asked me." He said, "Well, would you do it?" I said, sure. "I wasn't. I wasn't very well known at the time. Yeah, you know, a little bit known, but not. I was. I had won a bunch of awards and stuff, but I'm. I didn't have a name, really. You know, I had. To, I had the the ATCF. It was popular. It was being used a great deal. And for a couple of years." probably three years, I had been the first one to get parts cut out by laser. Nobody ever done that before. And I'd put the parts on my table at a show, and people would just go gaga. They thought that was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Space age material, titanium, the futuristic laser being used to cut their very own knife, and being able and to save them money. Design, the design, The design. And saving them money because I didn't have to sit behind a bandsaw chopping these things out, you know, etc. Okay. So Sal said, okay, so I designed this knife he called the C-15. It was kind of, a, it was a nice knife. It did uh, kind of a sheep's foot blade, uh, maybe two and a half, uh, maybe three inches. I can't remember how big it was. It's a nice knife. Clip on it and so forth. So Sal said, "Okay, beautiful design. We're going to make it." He says, uh, "What would you? What? What? What would you? What are your demands? My demand is the hole in the blade, which I put. I did that." He said, "What is? What? What are, you, what are your requirements?" And I said, uh, "Sal, sit down. Don't stand up. Sit down." Okay. I said, "Number one, I want this to be made in the United States." 
And he looked at me very skeptically because Spyderco had never made a knife in the United States. They were all made in Japan, Seiki City, every one of them. And many of the folding knives that were being made, and there weren't that many, were being made overseas. There were, but there were places like Camillus and Case that were being made in the United States. So he said, um, okay. I said, second of all, it's going to be a liner lock. This is 1989. No company had ever made a liner lock anywhere in the world. No company had ever made a liner lock. Keep that in mind. That's important to know. I said, number three, I want all the parts to be laser cut. No stamping. He said, do you know anybody that can do that? I said, yeah, I've got somebody. Arizona. Okay. And I said, I want the blade to be made of ATS-34, which was the equivalent of, one, of 154 CM, but made in Japan. The 154 CM in the United States could no longer be used for knives because it had been made originally for the jet engine turbines of the General Electric engine on the 747. They stopped using that, and Pratt and & Whitney started making the engines, so they stopped double vacuum cleaning the steel and it developed pits so we had to stop using it the Japanese picked it up they called it ATS 34 same steel I didn't like going to Japan for the steel but I had no alternative because that was my favorite steel that was the Bob Loveless steel okay. he said nobody's ever made a factory knife out of ATS 34 I said, I know. Do you know why? Because you can't stamp it. Every knife blade up to that point had been stamped. It had to be cut with a laser. Or a bandsaw, but nobody's going to sit and cut thousands of blades on a bandsaw. I said, that's why I want to use the laser. The laser will do it. He said, there's nobody who can make a liner lock. There weren't very many people making liner locks in 1989. There weren't a lot. There may have been a couple, aside from me and Michael Walker. I don't know who else. I said, I got one more thing. I said, I wanted to have scales made of G10. Nobody had ever used G10 on a folding knife before. I made ATCFs and model number ones with G10 scales, and I was the first one to use the G10 on a folding knife. Kevin McClung had made fixed blades, including the blade, out of G10. He called it the frequent flyer. It was all G10, one piece of G10. Okay. But nobody had ever put it on a folding knife before. So I'm, I'm going to try to shorten the story a little bit. I, I could tell this the whole detail but anyway he looked around couldn't find it he said nobody nobody knows how to make a liner lock he said you know the big companies like Camillus and these guys you know they don't want to make they, they don't even they don't even know what a liner lock is I said well you know there's one guy you should talk to his name is Les Diasis you know Les his name is Les Diasis he used to own Pacific Cutlery in California he went out of business he went bankrupt Pacific Cutlery, with Les Diasis, had a guy named Jody Sampson who was grinding blades for them. Jody Sampson made um, Schwarzenegger's sword for the first Conan movie. Okay. Um, and he worked for Les Diasis. They went bankrupt and so forth. So Sal got a hold of him, and it turned out that Les was going to start another little company. And then he disappeared for a while out of Los Angeles, and he reappeared up in Washington, up in uh, Oregon. Some, I think it was Oregon. So I'd hear that Leslie asked was was having trouble with uh, with the liner lock. They didn't know how to make it. And they couldn't get the angles right, and it was sticking. It wouldn't work. And 
So he called me up on the phone, and I, and I talked to his shop manager, who turned out to be a little English guy named Vince Ford, who didn't work for him at all. We, we envisioned that Les Diasis had opened up a factory. Okay. So I call this guy up, and I give him details of you know the, this angle and that angle, and make sure there's clearance and that clearance. Finally, they got him working, and they sent me a couple down, and they were actually pretty good. No titanium, stainless steel. The first ones had aluminum sides, anodized black aluminum sides. G10 came later, but at that point I said, okay, let's do what you can do just to get these things going. Okay, so, <clears throat> Sal and I, Sal calls me up one day and says, Bob, I was just at the auction of the Western Cutlery factory equipment. Western Cutlery went out of business. He said, this little guy with red hair, looks like a leprechaun, comes up and taps me on the shoulder and said, are you Sal Glesser from Spyderco? I said, yeah. He said, my name is Vince Ford. I said, yeah. He said, I'm making your knives for you up in Washington for Les the Acids. I said, really? I thought Les was making it. He said, no. Vince Ford, Les the Acids had opened up a storefront Next door was a storefront that was being used as a manufacturing facility with three homemade CNC machines. And Vince Ford and his father, Rob, were making valves for artificial hearts. I'll get this over. Rob. It turns out they made the C-15. Became wildly popular. Wildly popular. Nobody had seen a factory-made liner lock before. Ever. Wildly popular. First card is he made a lot of so three, six, three. Some things occurred, and I won't go seven, into them because there's no need three, to. Six, three. Um, there was a split between Les Diasis right, and Spider Co. Les Diasis went on to build his company into the Benchmade Knife Company. My knife was the genesis of the Benchmade Knife Company. That's how he was able to get started. Les Diasis to this day owns the Benchmade Knife Company. Sorry. Right, let's draw the second one. That is for publication. Second card is 722. Two, it's a bit of three. knife history. All right. <laughs> the only other brand. Not really. these to your wife and uh, your son. That's great. Thank you very much. I'm going to give you some. You ever see a danger tag? That's why. That's like this is a little business card thing that you can carry in your wallet on the airplane. Okay. On the back, hold it like this and break that down and you've got a very very sharp and deadly cutting edge on both sides of your finger. One time use, but only in an emergency. But you can carry it on an airplane. Because they have no idea what they're looking at. Thank you for the watch. Thank you for these. I can tell you that was about to know this is black. Thank you. I appreciate these. Good luck. Ugh, I gotta get back. We got a lottery going. Okay, I hope you enjoyed it. I think that was a really good interview. Uh, I haven't listened to it in a lot of years. I didn't put it up for the main reason it was no uh, video. And um, I really am kind of scared about not doing a good job, um, partly for the people who are watching it, but more so uh, for the people that I'm doing a video. I mean, Bob Terzuola is a really great man in the knife field, 
and I want to do a, a good job, but it's um, kind of a slow news day. Unfortunately, uh, we're all shut in uh, with this uh, turmoil we've got right now. Um, so I thought, let me drag it out because it is worthwhile. The reason there is no video is I asked uh, Bob if I could do this interview and he said, yeah, but uh, he didn't want to do any audio because at the same time somebody was doing a video on his life story and he didn't want to conflict with them. So I said, this is, that's okay, this is great. I had some really important questions uh, I wanted to ask him. You know, these guys are pretty hard to get a hold of and I had this book that I was putting together the reason I was so desperate to talk to Bob Terzuola is I had a question on uh, his idea of the liner lock mechanism. And there's so much information on the internet, but it's all these people's opinions. I mean, it's hard to find out if there's any real facts and these opinions conflict with each other. And I was putting this uh, book together that I wanted to put a big section on liner locks in because there's the uh, influence of liner locks is very big in uh, the knife industry right now. So uh, I made up my mind. I said, look, I'm going to go to this knife show where, where uh, Bob Terzol is, uh, even though it's uh, you know, miles away. So I, I said to my wife, I said, you know, I, I really think I need to... Uh, go to this knife show in Las Vegas. I was like, oh God, here it comes, you know. And she said, not with me, not without me or not. So I said, oh, well, great. Then I'm in. So I went there, didn't gamble, and uh, I got the information, uh, you know, firsthand, uh, which I was happy with. Now, if you got a copy of Bob Terzola's book, you know, exactly what I mean when he talks about that mechanism and he, I had him go over that uh, in the interview and I got to put that in the book and they also and that he really is one of the best knife making books out there and it was really hard to come by uh, I, I bought a copy years ago and I really enjoyed it but I, I believe they came out with a reprint of it, so you can get the, get the book. So, after all this effort, it was really surprising to me to hear from uh, Bob about this uh, mechanism that he, he came up with, made a lot of sense logically, but he really uh, has moved away from it uh, himself. And I've talked to a lot of big guys in the industry, like Chris Reeve and... Rick Hindra, uh, Mel Perdue, and these guys, and asked them about how they configure this mechanism. And it all comes down to just make it right, you know, and you don't want to make it sticky and you don't want to make it uh, slippery, you know, it, it all comes down to learning how to get that angle and uh, the lockup mechanism correct, and that's pretty much what they rely on, and that's... Uh, seems very agreeable because uh, these guys make some great knives. So I've learned a lot in my research. I certainly did learn a lot uh, talking to Bob Terzuola. I hope uh, you guys got something out of it and nothing else. It's just a great uh, story uh, about Bob uh, just to listen to. So thanks a lot.